ever so gently stabbing their <laughs> eye hole at weird angles until the lens moves out of the way. Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is to know nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at another episode of the hilarious Sam Onella Academy, looking at pre-industrial surgeries. Oh boy. Hey kids, had a bad day? Well, could be worse. You could be living in a world without modern <laughs> oh, anesthetic. No. Today, we'll be talking about some surgical procedures carried out long before the development of medicine as we know it today. It's not just the anesthesia stuff. Um, a lot of the older surgeries had to be conducted without the aid of modern imaging equipment, a lot of which uses radioisotopes and nuclear physics that works. So no CT scans, no PET scans, no, or even ultrasound. So not only were these surgeries questionable, they didn't always know where they should make the incision. So you... <laughs> There was more guesswork back then, so a lot less precision involved, even without the anesthesia. So, <laughs> now, once you uh, go back a certain distance, the line between operation and mutilation is pretty thin. Yeah. So, for our purposes, surgery refers to any bodily manipulation carried out with the intent of fixing okay. some injury or illness. And away we go. <laughs> the very first surgery that we have historical evidence for dates as far back as 6500 BC. Wow. It's called trepanning, which is a nice word for carving someone's frickin' skull open using nothing but a rock. I've never Maybe a rock on a stick if you were lucky. In all seriousness, though, you can see that a good deal of care went into the procedure, which That's lets precise. us know that this isn't just the result of random injury. Many skulls even showed signs of healing around the holes, meaning plenty of the people who underwent this whole thing just got up and went about their day afterwards. Alright, hold on, you say. This all sounds batch, uh, guano insane. <laughs> No way this was that common of an occurrence. Well, friend, if you've been watching this channel long enough, you should know that if you give human beings the benefit of the doubt, chances are they'll prove you wrong. In fact, so far, over 1,500 trepanned skulls have been dug up all across the globe, from Europe to China and even the Americas. This means that between 5 and 10% of all skulls that we've found from the Neolithic period have had at least one man-made no hole scraped into them. To put it this way, based on that data, there's a greater probability probability of someone born in the late stone age having their brain matter exposed by some shaman with a chunk of flint than someone born in the USA being a redhead. To this huh. day, nobody really knows why this was such a common practice, but most theories tend to revolve around the idea of releasing some kind of dark supernatural force from the patient. Man, I'm getting real sick of all these evil entities infecting our minds and bodies. Huh. You can say that again. I tell you, I need these demons like I need a hole in the head. No way. <laughs> Fast forward. <laughs> oh, that is that is so good. But did you realize that nuclear reactors are even older than 6500 BC? And I'm not just talking about the sun using nuclear fusion. I'm talking about nuclear fission here on Earth. At the Oklo region near Gabon, there was evidence, geological evidence, that there was a natural nuclear reactor over 1.7 billion years ago. Here's what it looks like today. It was a, a seam of uranium ore wedged in between sandstone that nuclear reactions occurred along this line. What would happen is the groundwater would um, mix in with the ore layer and there was just enough uranium in such a configuration that it could start up, it could Go, go critical and start a nuclear reaction because water, including groundwater, acts as a moderator that slows down the neutrons to the point where they can fission a uranium-235. Now, uranium-235 only exists in trace amounts naturally, but there was enough in this particular layer to do so. As it would generate heat, it would boil away the uh, groundwater, and in this case, uh, just like a modern pressurized water reactor, it has a negative void coefficient. So, increase the voids by boiling the water away, the reactor shuts itself down, and it restarts when the next layer of groundwater comes in through natural geologic processes. I like that it says multiple zones because it would just 
start up and shut down over natural fuel cycles across the millennia. It's, it's fascinating that this sort of thing could occur naturally. I, I, I would have lost that bet before hearing about this and saying uh, nuclear reactors um, predated uh, cavemen doing, doing surgery in uh, 6500 BC. <laughs> 600 BC. Over in India, there lived a guy called Maharshi Susuruta. Now, this guy was a medical. What is this? All right, medical mastermind house episodes. <laughs> Why asparagus makes you pee? <laughs> How to move it? No, your finger. Oh. <laughs> oh, these are these are great. <laughs> All the true medical mysteries. Mastermind. He wrote a treatise known as Susruta Samhita, which described countless different conditions, treatments, and yes, even surgeries. One of which is the first recorded instance of rhinoplasty. That means nose job. A hornbill's a type of bird. I'm <laughs> here too. Anyway, here's how it's what? done according to Susruta. First, you get them plastered, obviously. Second, you use a leaf to measure out the part of the nose you want fixed. Then, you use the leaf to cut off a flap of skin from the cheek or forehead of the patient. Yeah. This part's important though. No standard you gotta size remember to leave leaves. a little piece of it still attached. Otherwise, you just got a chunk of dirty dead face meat on your hands. Now, wherever you're looking to stick the new flesh on, you rub that part Ugh. raw with with a knife. Also, you're gonna want to stick two plant stalks in their nostrils so their nose keeps its proper shape. What? Slap the skin on, suture it, dust it with licorice powder for some reason, and cover it with cotton. Sesame oil should be regularly applied no until the skin is fully assault. healed. If you're like me, I already do that by default, so it shouldn't be an issue. Finally, at long last, your sniffer is reborn. Don't worry, you still look like a freak. Just slightly less so. Moving on, wow. our next surgery took place in 10th century Spain on Sancho the First of Leon, otherwise known as Sancho the Fat. Now, mm. normally back in the day, having some meat on your bones was a sign of wealth and power and all that, but this guy was like TLC documentary tier, to the point where he could hardly function as a human being. So his constituents said, Greetings, your thickness. Uh, your yeah, thickness. you can't be king anymore on account of you keep breaking every horse we give you, and nobody wants to wash between your your accordion That's like rare that someone back no then could be that After overweight. his adipose got him deposed, Sancho <laughs> decided to seek medical help for his condition under the oversight of well-reputed physician Hazdai Ibn Shapirut, which is an anagram for ha, paintbrush aids. <laughs> <laughs> I love these connections. That's amazing. Now, if there's one thing that medieval man understood, it's practicality. Lap band, gastric bypass, belly balloon, these all exist to help people who don't have the self-control to stop eating so much on their own. But Dr. Shapadu didn't believe in beating around the bush. He said, well, why don't we just stop the patient from shoving food into his own greasy maw in the first place, and decided to just up and stitch the dude's lips together. After wow. the operation, the only nutrients that Sancho received came through a straw, in the form of a mixture known as thoriaca, which was a complex blend of several herbs, fruits, and seeds, including opium. It was basically the closest thing you could find to lean at the time. Wow, that's, uh, you know what, a as an engineer, just treat the problem right at the source. Um, I mean, granted, he's creating a few other problems, but you know what, it, it makes sense. It, it holds up as a, using the engineering mindset. It's also a reason why a lot of engineers aren't doctors, a few reasons. Lean he became, losing around half his weight before ascending to the throne once more. So, this is the part of the video where I pander to the desires of the audience. If there's one thing I know you internet people can't get enough of, it's things going inside people's <laughs> eyeballs. Let's talk about cataract surgery. The art of dealing with people's clouded lenses has been around for millennia, believe it or not. That but one I actually knew, even from ancient Rome, just using a, using a knife really quickly, which is... Kind of similar to modern cataract surgery, except obviously it vibrates a lot faster using machines now. The Suruta guy from earlier actually talked about the most common procedure for cataracts from most of civilized history, which is known as the couching method. Couching is done by taking a sharp object like a needle or a thorn and ever so gently stabbing their <laughs> eye hole at weird <laughs> angles until the lens moves out of the way. No lasers, no sedatives, no paralytics, just a rusty old pin and some elbow grease the way God intended. The majority of the time, this operation didn't work, usually just damaging the already yeah. blind eye irreparably. 
Shocker, right? And even if it did go as planned, you still, you know, didn't have a lens in your eye. So you essentially went from, I can't tell if I'm dead or not, to, ah, yes, it is quite yellow out today. <laughs> By God. Something moved somewhere. A slightly more refined version oh, of this man. operation is the suction method, which dates back to at least the 10th century AD. <laughs> I don't like it's the not sound older. Of this, one. this procedure is described as requiring, quote, a large incision in the eye, a hollow needle, and an assistant with an extraordinary <laughs> lung capacity. Though this reads like the setup to the world's most horrifying party trick, no. it's actually the bare minimum number of tools needed to completely extract the lens from the eye. That's in case horrific. you didn't pick up on how, here's a diagram. This method generally saw a greater success rate and fewer complications than its non-extracting counterpart. So hopefully you can sleep well tonight knowing that the number of human beings who have sucked a piece of somebody's living eyeball through a straw is above zero. Anywho, let's all just be <laughs> that, thankful that we live in an rough. era where procedures like these are a thing Craziness. of the past. Now remember kids, even though the surgeries I described here do sound pretty easy to pull off, please don't try them at home. That was crazy. I knew about the uh, the ancient cataract surgery, but I didn't know it involved someone sucking sucking it out. That's just uh, reminds me of that old uh, urban legend that hey, you should suck the poison out when someone's bitten by a snake. Uh, don't don't do that either. That's just gonna create risk of contamination and doesn't even save the individual in question. Just use an experienced medical professional, an experienced medical professional that has the aid of nuclear technology with advanced uh, imaging things like a uh, CAT scan or CT scan or PET scan, uh, MRI use nuclear technology too. So, hey, if you support using nuclear technology for uh, peaceful purposes, please join me on my journey to a clean nuclear energy future by liking, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.